Great. Thank you, Vasanti. Uh, now I'm very pleased to introduce the moderator of our first panel, the Learning Health System, Dr. Seema Marwa. Dr. Marwa is probably known to many of you, but for those who do not know, she is an internal medicine physician based in Toronto and editor-in-chief at Healthy Debate. Seema is a graduate of the Monk Global Journalism Program and has a master's degree from Harvard in Media and Education. She's passionate about her work, which focuses on patient experience, health system design, and advocacy for racialized and marginalized communities. And one of Healthy Debate's special series, including several articles on the learning health system in Ontario, which I encourage you to review and share. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Seema Marwa. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here and welcome you all to what promises to be hopefully an informative and engaging hour. That series on learning health systems is right at the top of the Healthy Debate page, um, who OSU generously supports. So if you'd like to check out that series, um, we'll tweet it out later as well. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Healthy Debate, and I'm so excited to be here to chair this panel. During this hour, we hope to introduce you to a variety of perspectives related to Ontario learning health systems. We want you to understand the Made in Ontario version of the learning health system that is the result of very targeted and important work of both SPOR and CIHR, touching on everything from citizen engagement to patient involvement, implementation requirements, and embedding equity into the design of future systems. So on the panel today, we have several experts, many of whom have mentored me, and I thank, um, representing different perspectives. I'm not gonna read their full bios, just in the interest of time, but they are in the pro programming material that we have today, but I am gonna introduce them briefly and let you know what lens they're gonna be bringing during this panel. So first we have John Lavis. So he's bringing an evidence support perspective. We have Walter Woodchis, who brings an expertise in evaluation. Carrie Koleski, bringing a patient-oriented researcher perspective. Nakia Lifoon, who is an equity scholar, is going to be bringing that lens today. Rob Reed, who brings, among other things, the researcher perspective. Maureen Smith, bringing the very important patient partner and patient perspective. And Tess Romaine, who is bringing a health systems leader's lens as a community health leader. So first off, we're gonna get started with Rob, Maureen and Tess, who have prepared a brief presentation so that everyone watching can, can get a framework of the learning health system and an idea of where we are in Ontario to sort of jump off the, the panel with. So I'm gonna pass the, the mic over to Rob and if we could get those slides up, that would be great. Hey, thanks so much, Seema. And I really do wanna thank uh, Dean, Asante, and others at OSU for the opportunity and invitation to, to talk to you today on behalf of the whole panel today. Um, and uh, I also wanted to thank the Austria's Learning Health System Work Group. Uh, we had an opportunity to uh, road test the, this talk uh, a few days ago, uh, with them and they gave a really good uh, insight. Um, so when we were, got asked to do this presentation today, this, uh, this uh, forum today, we got asked a couple things uh, by Cassandra and Dean. The first was to really give a bit of a Coles Notes version to everybody about uh, what the learning health system and its, and its meaning. And I think I just dated myself but because I use calls notes. I'm not sure they're a thing anymore. Uh, the second is um, to present a made in Ontario uh, framework that we could all use uh, to ground our work in the learning health system. And then third is to really delve into some key features of learning health system. Uh, and that's what the, pan the remainder of the panel are going to do today. When we all accepted the challenge, uh, we came to the realization that the learning health system is really a three-legged stool, um, that, uh, that it's a real partnership between patients, researchers, and health system leaders. And that's why I'm really excited to be joined by Maureen and Tess, who in addition to me, will be rounding out the perspectives on the learning health system in the first part of this presentation. So I'm gonna start first, and then I'm gonna hand it off to Maureen and Tess in a few minutes. Uh, let's move to the next slide and the next slide. Great. Um, so for, for uh, research history buffs like me, the learning health system concept is relatively new. It started, it, it originated about in 2007. Um, and, uh, and then it was the Institute of Medicine that gave it its original meaning. Uh, and it, it was really in response to the continued and pervasive and uh, lag uh, between the, the generation of evidence and the implementation for benefit for educated patients. 
Um, and really, the Institute of Medicine called for a complete reframing of our research paradigm, um, where uh, the, 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 the idea was to shift research and embed it directly into day-to-day -day care delivery, management, and policy, and merge the research enterprise with uh, continuous quality improvement, um, and they called it the learning health system. Um, the idea also takes advantage of the, the data-rich EMRs and IT infrastructures that we now have uh, available, and it enables rapid cycle change, um, as well as it also takes advantage of the natural occurring heter heterogeneities that we have in our health system with patients programs and the settings uh, for a variety of different learnings. And the Institute of Medicine made it also a very important point that they posited that the patient the community should be the catalyst for change in the learning health system. And so I'm happy to say that that is absolutely we're living that concept in, in Ontario. Um, the idea was uh, the, the IOM envisioned a day that every patient encounter would contribute to the new body of knowledge that could be in one day, that could be used in, for the patients in the next day. So this was rapid, rapid use of evidence and generation of use of evidence. Um, and in, the, in Ontario, the idea really gained momentum about in 2018, when John uh, Labus and colleagues uh, proposed this Ontario definition I've got up on the slide here. Um, and it's a, you know, states that it's a combination of a, learning, a health system and a research system that's anchored in patients' needs, perspectives, and aspirations, driven by timely data and evidence, uh, supported by the appropriate decision supports, governance, financial care delivery arrangements, and is enabled uh, with a culture and competencies for rapid, uh, rapid learning and improvement. And I really want to thank John and colleagues for establishing this definition. Uh, because it really does ground us in what we want to do right here. Next slide, please. Um, we can conceptualize um, the, the evolution of learning health system in this schematic. Um, and most of us remember the days uh, when research and care were separate and distinct enterprises at the first two circles that talked at the top. And it was really the scientist's job to write in journals and then just assume that care delivery systems took it up and implemented pervasively across the system. And we all know how well that worked. And it resulted in delays lags, inconsistencies, missed opportunities uh, with research uptake. Um, uh, the next iteration was the evolution, was the introduction of KTE, uh, which was indeed a real step forward in terms of brokering the research and, and, uh, and care delivery enterprise with a focus on promoting two-way exchange between researchers and system leaders to both refine the questions we ask, um, the methods we use, as well as promote rapid cycle uptake. Um, and the learning health system is really just about continued evolution in this paradigm, and, but it is really now distinctly about merging the research and health system enterprises uh, uh, and establishing research and development functionalities right within health systems, uh, embedding them in our system enterprise, uh, and blend, blending the boundaries or blurring the boundaries with research, quality improvement, and decision support functionalities um, that we have in our health systems. Um, and we're seeing a growth in Ontario right now uh, with, with infrastructures to support this merged enterprise. Um, and just an example of this would be the CIHR impact fellows and the OHT impact fellows uh, program in the province. Um, and so let's go to the to the next slide here. This is a bit of a lightning, uh, a lightning quick Coles notes version. Um, this I wanted to stop at this slide for a minute just to ground us in the fact that learning is needed at multiple levels entwined uh, all the way from the, the, the micro level and the individual patient and provider level through to the macro level, like the high level policy level. These are all intertwined. So the learnings about effectiveness, efficiency, and patient centeredness at the micro patient clinician level need to be fed to the higher levels so that we can learn how systems need to be designed, organized, financed, and regulated to support this type of uh, 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 need to these type of innovations. Um, this also this slide also highlights the importance of learning at the community level uh, because of the importance of context. We all know that a one-size-fits-all approach to care delivery uh, in Ontario is not an optimal solution, given the distinct differences that we have in geographies, patient needs, risks, health system structures, and capacities, and the like. Um, so, uh, a community lens on this we know that we need to be important. 
Uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, this is the most uh, commonly used uh, simple conceptual framework that was introduced by Charles Friedman right next door in the University of uh, Michigan uh, several years ago um, a, a, a for a conceptual model of their learning health system. And it, it is uh, very intuitive, very simplistic, and it forms the basis uh, for the generation of other models and frameworks that are now used across the world. Um, it focuses on two evidence transitions. First is about the iterative generation of knowledge from everyday practice and community settings. And the second then is to immediately feed this knowledge back to practices for change. So the, the, the core concept is really uh, using data derived from clinical practice and management to find the knowledge gaps, fill those gaps, and then feed knowledge directly back to policy and practice for change. Okay. Well, this model is, is, is simple. It does lack a, a sufficient specificity to guide actually how we implement this in, 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 uh, in Ontario. And it does miss some fundamental things that we're going to be talking about today, like perspectives on populations, patient and family centeredness, and so forth. So for the reason for that reason, we're we're actually introducing a new framework. Um, and the next slide is um, that uh, um, and this is Vasanthi's and Dean's challenge is to come up with a made in Ontario framework that builds off Friedman's original uh, work uh, and emphasizes a few other characteristics that we believe to be necessary. And rather presenting rather than presenting that as a virtual circle, we present it as an engine for change. Uh, with a variety of interarticulated gears that need to be constantly fueled for impact. So it's not just a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is an active process that goes on and needs fuel for change. Um, and we start with the dark blue circle here, uh, which is where, which is really all about the data. Um, and it's to try to understand where the system gaps are, what's driving them, what are the priorities and problems that we're facing, where are the inequities? And we're calling this one market scanning and population insights. And we're, we're laying it on here that this is not just at the individual patient level, but it's actually population-based insights. Because in Ontario, uh, we, we actually are responsible uh, for delivering care to entire populations, whether they seek care or not. Um, the second is all about designing solutions, um, uh, the, the light blue circle. And it's about finding the evidence based from elsewhere and then adapting it for local context with the input from sister system users, particularly patients and their communities, um, as well as care providers. And we call this gear the synthesizing co-design co component. And the third gear is all about implementation as an always event, and then cementing and scaling it to the refinement and change as we go. Um, and what's unique about this model is a couple fold. One is it explicitly focuses on entire populations and the individuals who comprise them, and, and then layers in equity considerations of all phases of the learning. Uh, and we believe that this is of fundamental importance in Ontario as we move forward. Let's go to the next slide. So, so few would argue, few would argue with what I've talked about today, and I don't think I've had any, found anybody in Ontario that would say that um, that learning health systems are not important. Or it's not the direction that they go, uh, and many actually say we're doing this already. Um, so that this is not uh, something new, um, and uh, uh, and we we discussed this at our working group at the at, at, at the Aussie working group. Um, and we, we, we actually believe that we're actually substantially far from this vision of where we want to go. Um, and these are just some of the features uh, that, uh, that, um, that uh, we believe we need to change. First is we, we operate often uh, in distance still from health systems, not in an integrated fashion, with researchers working often in, in small groups and clicks. Um, second is that we often uh, just take what we've done before um, and may rebrand it as a living health system offer, offering uh, rather than this continual evolution that's embedded right into right that we did with the care group. Um, often uh, we think about equity as an afterthought or as an additional aim rather than a fundamental uh, a tenant throughout all of these processes. And then finally, we are talking about systems here. Uh, we're not talking about institutions, we're talking about integrated, organized delivery systems. Um, that extend beyond health care to health. Um, and so we often still work 
in very much in silos uh, uh, across the other device. So I'm going to stop now and I'm going to hand it over to Maureen and she's going to bring you a bit of a, a patient perspective on this. Um, and I think she's going to be a bit provocative for us. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Rob, for the introduction to Learning Health Systems in Ontario and the opportunity to join a panel and provide a patient and citizen perspectives. Um, next slide, please. Okay. I thought you'd be interested in hearing the perspectives of a few of my colleagues on the Ontario Sports Support Unit's Patient Partner Working Group. So the first perspective in green, I guess, lime green, speaks to the optimism of what can be achieved in learning health system that embeds our voices as partners in this enterprise. The second quote highlights the importance of trust, transparency, and partnership, and the public education that is a necessary component. I think the pandemic has taught us that. <laughs> The third comment addresses the issue of breaking down silos and learning from past errors and successes quickly to optimize healthcare. And finally, a perspective that we've heard many times, how do patients fit in? Will it help us? And do we have input into, into it in any way? So you hear support for, for new directions expectations that it will improve health care as the goal of patients, caregivers, and citizens as true partners is realized and willingness to be part of the system. From my own perspective, a system that values continual learning and adjusts policies, procedures, and guidelines to reflect that learning is certainly appealing to patients, caregivers, and citizens. A person who's in pain or is waiting for feedback on an innovative procedure does not have the luxury of time for therapies that have the most favorable outcomes. Which brings me to how I currently see our role in the learning health system. One leg of a wobbly stool. Next slide, please. Next and last slide. There we go. So there's no doubt that the lived experiences of patients, caregivers, and citizens are a pillar of the learning health system. We often hear the term embedded in the system. That needs to truly occur and be explained to us in plain language so that we can see concrete examples of how it is operationalized. There's a tremendous opportunity for everyone in Ontario to maximize the use of evidence that is used to make healthcare decisions. This system will bring together patients, caregivers, and citizens who are already partnering in all types of evidence, be it evidence synthesis, patient-partnered primary research, and health quality initiatives, such as those undertaken by our patient and family advisory councils. A framework that clearly lays out how we are embedded will do much to help people understand the promise of this new system. We want to walk along the road with clinicians, researchers, and decision makers and funders, but need a detailed hiking map of what we will encounter and how our lived experiences and other skills will be embedded to become part of the solution. Thank you. So thank you, Maureen. Maybe I'll jump in here as I, I think I'm next on this one. Okay, Seema? Yeah, I was just going to throw it to you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Rob and, and Maureen. And, and I think the exciting part is how can providers and the provider team be really positioned to be that partner to patients uh, as we move forward? Uh, and so there are three places that we really want, I really focused on uh, leveraging and aligning to the comments that Maureen said, as well as the uh, three components of the learning health system. The first one is early engagement and partnership. And I think part of the, uh, the important part that I wanted to highlight here is that 
we talk about the change and implementation and adaption and to do that i think really ensuring that those who are delivering the care and partners in that delivery are part of the early engagement and can help inform uh, some of the barriers and oftentimes they have a great understanding of some of the challenges and barriers uh, that are that are in the way of being able to implement evidence and, and practice change i think that when we speak to the right team members Oftentimes we're referring to clinicians. And I think that part of the um, opportunity is also understanding that a healthcare team can be, it is usually supported by, by a group of people who support the clinician. So uh, thinking about uh, frontline staff. So my organization is a long-term care home. There's personal support workers, but recreation therapists and others. And how do we support them to be part of uh, that early engagement and in, in informing uh, as well as they can be great partners to support residents and family participation uh, going forward. Uh, and then these, the last point on this section is really that clearly defined roles. And I'll, although I say it, I will, I will note sometimes that we lump policy decision makers and clinicians into the same category. And oftentimes they're very different people uh, who have different roles in this. And so uh, there's a, a target to the policy and decision makers and funders for sure, clinicians, absolutely, but also frontline staff, as well as those who produce data, who are leaders of frontline staff. How do we ensure that they are aligned and have their voice involved so that they have buy-in uh, throughout the process in terms of focusing on implementation and adaption? The second area is resourcing and capacity building. So how do we support team members to participate in the co-design and defining of solutions? Again, to really be the par partner to the patients in terms of implementing events uh, and, and, and practice change. So really that commitment and buy-in. And when we say all levels of the organization, it's as important that the leader of the organization, as well as those delivering frontline care and clinicians are all aligned and, and feel that support and commitment to be able to make the change as well as enabling the capacity. Um, so when I speak about capacity, it's not just in funding, but it's actually in resourcing people to participate. Uh, it's, it's difficult to do off the side of someone's desk. Uh, and, if the, and if we don't, if leaders are not enabling uh, team members uh, to participate in the, in the change initiative or in practice change, um, then it's often difficult. And I think I, I felt, and we often hear the frustration that sometimes come, comes with a, uh, a research project and a great idea, but not necessarily the capacity to be able to implement it uh, and, and be able to sustain the change. So opportunities to do that through uh, participation, buy-in, partnering in the co-design element, I think really can help in terms of ensuring that we sustain that change moving forward. And then really thirdly, aligned implementation. So speaking to how do we ensure that an organization sees the benefit? I think we all uh, can see the benefit of a learning health system, as Rob said, as Maureen said, I think a lot of, they'd be hard pressed to find anyone who said they don't wanna do this. But how do we ensure that we can align our internal uh, strategies? So is there an opportunity to support that team members can uh, can have better skill development, talent management, retention, professional development by participating, by enabling them to participate uh, in, these, in these types of initiatives. Uh, and really thinking about uh, this work, the learning health system as part of the organization strategy. It's not something that comes up that uh, someone wants to participate in, but it's actually part of the organization's value and the organization and decision makers see the value in participation, whether it's in terms of uh, financial or retention, professional development, and of obviously in outcomes for patients. Uh, but how do we ensure that those are all aligned? And then I think we have, uh, we have an opportunity to truly advance uh, the great work that's already being built and support, I think the most exciting part is healthcare transformation that we know patients and caregivers and families want to see and enable the providers to be partners on that journey and sustain that change. So maybe I'll end there and happy to turn back to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Tess. Um, so Rob, I'm just confirming. So I think that that's the presentation complete. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right, uh, Seema. So I think we've given the 101 uh, and incorporated a whole variety of different perspectives. So now let's delve into a discussion.
That sounds great. So let's get those slides off um, of the, the broadcast. And um, I'm going to lead off my first. So I know, Maureen, you just spoke, but I'm going to put you on the spot for the first question. Um, so I, you know, you mentioned the role of patients is one leg on a wobbly stool, and that visual is in my mind. Um, so what I want to know is, we know it's important to engage and embed patients at all levels, but what are the barriers to this happening currently? And can you give us an idea of sort of what, what, what the, the issue is with, with having that happen in the current state? Thank you, Seema. Well, they call it a learning health system for a reason, right? So for me, that implies that we're going to contribute at many stages of the system and we're truly embedded in it. There are barriers to that because there, there's training, there's support, there's buy-in from all of the members that, that's really needed. That's why the that's why the the stool is wobbly. People on, you know, who are here and who are attending have bought in and are committed to this. We've got to get that spread across the province. So we've got all of these great lessons learned from 10 years of, you know, even longer for patient and family advisory projects and in patient partnered research. And we understand now that collaboration begins at the inception stage. And it's not presenting people with a final draft at the end and asking for, for their feedback. Well, what if what are you going to do if they say that you kind of went went down the wrong road? Are you going to are you going to scrap two two three years of work and start all over again? So it's it's imperative that we understand how the evidence will be used. Also, whether it's like we're synthesizing already existing evidence, we should have a say in that, and or we're creating new evidence. So we want to be part of the solution. And when I say we, very important that, that includes a wide variety of people engaged at various stages of collecting that evidence and feeding the learning health system. And that population focus is really important because it involves everyone. And I, I said earlier, the pandemic has really taught us about public health and and on all of that. So I think the, the leg is wobbly because we're all there. We're all ready to collaborate and share our incredible wealth of lived experience, you know, of navigating the healthcare system or living or caring for people with medical conditions. But we're not sure how the system will support receiving our knowledge and how that will actually inform the rapid learning that should take place. Communication, like communicating the successes in doing this, which you know are already occurring in, in some projects, and ensuring that those diverse voices are heard are really the keys to stabilizing that three-legged stool. And as an internal optimist, I, I think we're going to get there, and I see a lot of hope in this system. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maureen. I, I um, yeah, that, that leaves me feeling a little hopeful. Uh, it also makes me think a lot of Carrie Koleski's work um, because, you know, Carrie, you've said that learning health systems will function most optimally if we honor value and include the perspectives of all parties. And I think that feeds into your co-design work and a lot of the points that Maureen just made that it's not just about one party, but about engaging everyone and bringing them along. So I'm wondering if you can explain this a little bit further uh, to us and tell us why patient, citizen and community engagement and co-design is so integral to a functioning learning health system. Thank you so much, Seema, and thank you so much, Maureen. That wobbly stool metaphor really, really resonates because I think we can all relate to the projects, the initiatives, the things that we work on that we're so excited about, but then they don't land. There's no receptor. There's no implementation. People are going, what happened? We work so hard on this. And so when you bring the right stakeholders to the table, including the researchers, patient and family partners, decision makers, as Tess said, the frontline providers, people that are all invested and understand the problem. If you really work together to understand it, to value each other's perspectives, then you can have a greater chance of implementation. I think there's been a lot of focus um, on the patient researcher partnership and making that really, really strong, which is fantastic and it's absolutely fundamental. But if we don't also include uh, figuring out how to, how to have strong relationships with decision makers, with providers, with the receptors of what we're working on, it's not gonna land. And I think if I were to explain learning health systems quite simply, it's the landing place for all the work that we do. A learning health system ensures that we focus on the priorities that we all agree on, 
and then also figure out what is that enabling uh, context and window of opportunity for us to implement. So that the learning health system is a context to take our work and for it to land. So it doesn't become lost in a bunch of other priorities and initiatives that we're working on. So, so yeah, the wobbly stool really resonates and the learning health system concept really fits with, with how we're trying to move our stuff into practice. Thank you so much. That, that is really clear. I think that also feeds really well into the work that John does, um, because evidence and good quality evidence is clearly a cornerstone of the learning health system, and not just how it's generated, but how it's used and continually um, updated and iterated on. Um, so, John, I wanted to ask you specifically feeding off of what Carrie said. So how does the generation and use of good evidence differ in the learning health system versus sort of what we can think of as the current state or what we're trying to change from? Absolutely. Well, you know, part of it is, you know, embedded in your question, that conduct and use piece is so important. I think one of the differences is we need to be as focused on using the existing evidence that we have as we need to be focused on the flow of future evidence. And I think patient-oriented research is primarily about engaging patients, families, and caregivers in the flow of new evidence. But, you know, I've learned more in the last two and a half years about uh, providing evidence support than I had in the previous 25. And some of that I've learned at the knee of Maureen Smith, who has challenged us to say patient partners need to be at the table also when we synthesize the evidence and put it in front of policymakers and their lived experiences can help shape that research. Um, another thing that I really loved about uh, the slides that Rob pulled together, the pyramid, um, and Tess spoke to this a bit, is that we need to move from this approach of where we zero in on a particular level and say, no, for any given change, like the massive change of moving to population health management, there's pieces of that that need to be owned by government policymakers, others by system and organizational leaders, others by frontline workers and teams, others by patients, families, and caregivers. And we need to support each of them with the best evidence and engage them in the production of new research. Uh, the other thing that I love about Rob's slides, the gears metaphor, um, is we need to bring different forms of evidence to bear at different stages. Uh, the early work on learning health systems was super obsessed with data analytics, helpful at the front end with understanding problems, helpful at the monitoring implementation step, but we need behavioral and implementation research if we want to drive change in the system. We need robust evaluations if we're going to inform co-design. So I don't think this is just a, a rebranding of KT. I think it's a fundamental re-envisioning of what we're here to do, which is support people at all of these levels, really change the system in ways that better need uh, meet the needs of patients. So I'm thrilled that we're now starting to get on the same page about what this all is and working out our respective roles in uh, in contributing to it. I mean, what you're speaking about is broad disruptive change. You know, yep. in, in environments that typically are not so receptive to broad receptive change, um, and there's a lot of organizational challenges to that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, which which makes me think of of Nikia as an equity scholar. Um, just as patients need to be embedded in every part of this process, so should equity and frankly anti-racism, and that might require some disruptive change as well. So I'm wondering if you can um, give us an idea of how you might suggest we approach embedding equity and anti-racism in the learning health system, since we are going to be making some disruptive changes. Sure, and it sounds like we're already considering some disruption, <laughs> and I'm also having some disruption in the background because my dog is very upset that uh, <laughs> I'm talking to you right now. <laughs> so when I think about what has been said thus far, and also considering the gears of change that we've come up with in terms of our, our learning health systems, I think of equity as in total as equity needs to be in all health systems so just as there's health in all policies there should be equity in all health systems and that means it needs to be embedded in all aspects of the learning health system in terms of how research is selected populations identified and collaborated with data collected and analyzed another thing to keep in mind is that equity is not just a black and white issue 
right? It's imperative that those who are part of the data synthesis and co-design and implementation of new services and models represent the full diversity of the healthcare system. So just as Maureen said, just as John and Carrie, that means clinicians, as well as frontline service providers, personal support workers and beyond, uh, including a range of citizens, patients and stakeholders that are coming from a wide array of equity deserving groups. And when I say equity deserving groups, that means systems need to do the work to actually understand the population they serve and the various groups within them, and also actively engage with these populations in an authentic way. So just as was said earlier, we can't just come to folks after the fact, after we've created our research initiatives, we have to make sure that we're actively engaging folks. And this engagement might be quite difficult because due to systems, um, you know, past interactions with, with various groups and their mistrust of these systems due to experiences of racism, discrimination, uh, but this engagement needs to be done. And then within a learning health system framework, equity data must come from a mixed method approach, right? So we can't just, you know, use quantitative data collection analysis because it can't really, again, I'm coming from a qualitative world, but, and I do some mixed methods, but, you know, quantitative data analysis alone can't really shed full light on healthcare users' experiences, their treatment, treatment disparities, health outcomes, and barriers to care, and how best to deliver resources that reflect users' needs, right? And oftentimes, quantitative data analysis alone fails to pick up on, on a lot of the socio-historical contexts upon which you know, our healthcare systems are based and the impacts that that has had and continues to have on equity deserving populations. And only a qualitative, uh, you know, a qualitative quantitative approach that includes healthcare users and patients in data collection and analysis can really shed light on the best way to design and implement and adapt services. And then finally, equity is about and means accountability, right? And it's not enough to say that we're including equity in our work and we're just splashing equity into the actual, uh, into our actual reports, but that means that it needs to actually be a explicitly mentioned and put in place to ensure that equity is a constant component and uh, part of healthcare intervention outcomes. And that can come in the form of financial incentives, concrete and approved system milestones, and system leader performance evaluation. So everyone needs to be accountable when it comes to equity. Yeah, I think those are great points and resonate a lot with what Maureen said as well, because it's not just about tokenism or checking something off a box, but truly embedding um, different perspectives into the system. I mean, you did you used a lot of um, evaluation terms in there, which makes me think of Walter, who I'm going to throw to next. So I heard qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods. I mean, what I'm thinking about here as a researcher as well is, you know, this seems incredibly complex and challenging to evaluate um, and know if we're achieving what success looks like over the long term. So, so Walter, I mean, what are some of the barriers to evaluation, and why is it so critical to overcome them? Yeah. Um... Thanks very much, and uh, it's it's nice to to have this position uh, following so many really enlightening, uh, I think, points that have been made so far. Um, and you know, I think when I've been working with uh, providers that are looking to implement new models of care and trying to do it, and I'm trying to come at it from a learning health system perspective, um, the first barrier I run into often is, um, uh, and I think it's something we need to to address in the learning health system, is people are afraid that evaluation is a test. Uh, and that brings a risk of failure, uh, as opposed to looking at evaluation as really essential and a part of learning. Uh, and so I'm mostly asking people in evaluation, so, you know, what are you trying to achieve? And we will measure you against what you are trying to achieve, not some other, you know, uh, esoteric test that we're going to come in from externally. Like, really, what are you trying to do? And let's measure you against your own goals. Um, and that hopefully breaks down the fear, um, because that is, I think, one of the biggest barriers that we run into is to make it part of what they're doing and what they want to do. Um, I think, uh, how do we enable learning health systems with evaluation work? So first off is we need to be useful. Uh, so to be useful, we need to be a little bit robust, but we need to be rapid. Uh, you know, we have to have timely updates on progress, and that has to really be made available to the implementers, providers, and patients. Um, not just for evaluators or funders to look at. It actually needs to be used by the frontline people. Uh, and then, you know, measures for data monitoring need to be clearly linked to the goals that they're trying to implement in the specific programs. Um, and then, you know, when I say frequency, 
Uh, we've used frequencies of monthly and even weekly on some things like patient feedback and quarterly for more uh, measures that are related to healthcare utilization, or you might be a little bit more concerned about having enough power or enough sample size. Um, and so that sort of balance between sufficient data, reliability, and timeliness. Um, and so uh, needs to be, you know, we need to weigh that off. And I'd rather get, you know, mostly very good data back to people in a timely way than perfect data never. Um, so that's, I think, uh, part of overcoming that. And, uh, you know, I think of this as sort of like giving data back almost like, you know, if you're in a classroom, classroom quizzes, right? Like they're not really going to count much towards your final grade, but we're making sure we're on the right track and enabling those kind of rapid adjustments. Um, and the last, the last point, uh, and you you raised it, is uh, is that the data need to be both qualitative and quantitative, um, and that needs to be ensuring that the sol system solving the right problem, um, that the opportunities to improve uh, efficiency and sustainability of programs are identified. Um, and outcomes of importance to patients, caregivers, and providers are being included, and they're not always easily quantified or quantifiable. So we need to be able to tell the story and, and ask people how things are going. And finally, uh, on the qualitative side as well, important contextual information is uh, available, and it's really important to understand the mechanisms of why the program is working or not achieving the desired outcomes. Um, and uh, I think the last point to reflect on is that for more complex systems, and particularly with uh, inter uh, interwoven uh, parts of the health system, you know, primary care, home care, hospital providers, is you need to enable uh, time for self reflection um, and and sense making, and that's uh, just really important and useful for programs to adjust their approaches and make sure that they're really considering if they're still heading for the same goals or uh, what they need to have as a common vision for that work. Um, so that's just some. Some thoughts. Um, Eddie Nason is watching and he says, Walter is spot on. Evaluation is not an audit. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that out loud, which is great. Hi, Eddie. Um, and Walter, I had a follow up question. So, you know, the, the evaluation, the types of evaluation you're talking about is more nimble, it's more flexible, um, it's more iterative. Does the funding match um, the, the type of evaluation you need to do? And, and how do you address that, that challenge? Because to me, that pops right into my mind. Like what you're saying makes so much sense, but how we fund projects is very different right now. Um, well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I benefit from gracious groups such as Ontario Sports Support Unit, as well as the Ministry of Health that, you know, have provided a vested interest in understanding and using evaluation in the health system. Um, and, and I'll say it's, you know, we, uh, my primary client used to actually be like Osu or the ministry, but actually now I view my client to be the frontline providers. Uh, because they're actually the ones that can make the change. If I hand an evaluation back report back to the ministry about how things went, um, they can't actually do anything about it, right? And that's um, because they're not actually implementing the model. So I'm much more now uh, nimble. And so um, I think for, for significant systems to have a learning health system, we need to make sure that there's funding available um, and resourced um, to do, you know, that just doesn't have to be me, but it has to be, there's a lot of qualified researchers and, and evaluators out there. Right now we're benefiting from, you know, Ontario Health uh, Team Impact Fellows, which are post-grad students that are actually out there. Um, well, they're not students anymore. They're they're uh, mostly postdoctoral, uh, and and they're able to work close to the front line. So I think there needs to be a resource that enables evaluation to be implemented at the at the coal face at those front lines, uh, and that needs to be part of program funding. Um, and uh, and organizations that are interested in learning need to have that resource. And in fact, it's been proved beneficial enough that many of the o OHD Impact Fellows have been brought on by the Ontario Health Teams now as full-time employees to help with that evaluation because they've proven their value. I've seen that happen with the uh, CHR Health System Impact Fellows too. So I think you know we're starting to seed, and organizations uh, are seeing the value of that work and uh, and setting aside the, the the funds for the resources. Thank you for that. I, I, have, I have one last question for Tess, and then we'll move to some of the audience questions that have been coming in. Um, so Tess, you already spoke a lot about the points that you were going to make today, but I have one follow-up question. Um, so you talk a lot about um, engagement of all types of frontline um, healthcare workers, but also um, health system leaders like yourself, and this is a tall order. So my question is, like, there's no doubt that we have to do this, but it's the how. Um, do you have any thoughts uh, on how we can do that? 
Uh, and a great point. I think that's always the hard part. It's the how. And I think building on Walter's point, it is the implementation and the sustained implementation that's always difficult. I mean, I think there's um, some of the pieces that I did speak to, you know, being able to um, under engage team members and uh, have them understand that the change is beneficial. It aligns with your organization strategy. I think seeing this as a something else to do versus, and then I have my regular work is part of part of what we need to bridge. This is actually integrated. Being part of uh, being a learning health system actually means that you can achieve your strategy. There is value in your organization for participating in whether that's a resource or capacity or or simply being able, as, as I mentioned, uh, to look at opportunities to support your team members is really key. I, I think that um, a lot of organizations want to participate. I, I don't think there's a sense that people don't want to participate or don't want to make these changes. It is about how do we enable people to feel like this is not, uh, or I, I often use work off the side of your desk, um, you know, and that there's capacity to do that. Um, but I do think that there's um, there's great opportunities, especially as, as Walter was saying in some of the work happening with OHTs and uh, connecting research and, and evidence and demonstrating that it will lead to value and efficiency in uh, opportunities to out, uh, better quality outputs in connecting you and being able to have better connection across the system. And again, achieving your strategic goals or strategic outcomes really will enable uh, leaders to understand why this is uh, an opportunity um, and not extra work. Um, and I think also, Nikki spoke to equity, I think opportunities to also have uh, different team members participate and be part of that development is also an opportunity for those team members. And sometimes uh, th those can be very diverse groups. So opportunities to engage them and be part of that is also, I think, part of that um, equity um, focus and, and change ahead. And then we we really build that buy-in, but it is it is always the challenge, the implementation. But uh, I think there's great opportunities, and we've talked about uh, for leaders to see that this is actually aligned to the goals that we already have as a system. Oh, thank you for that. Um, we have one uh, comment from Moira from the audience. So she says, in primary care research, implementation failures are found to be due to lack of co-design. So this supports Carrie's important presentation. So Carrie, I wanted you to know you had that feedback. And then we have an audience question uh, for, I'm gonna, it's for everyone, but I'm going to throw it to Rob from Frank Gavin. Um, and then if other people have comments, I'll, I'll go to you after. So there seems to be an assumption that all the groups, um, example, patients, clinicians, administrators, policymakers, have the same priorities. How um, sure are we that this is true? How do we know? And what if the priorities are different? So Rob, maybe you can speak to that. That's a, that's a really good question from Frank. And you know, the, the, there are many tensions in the learning health system framework. And one of the, the biggest tensions is actually setting the learning agenda, what the priorities are for learning. And what we're positing today is that this has to be a three-legged stool, meaning it is absolutely essential that the priorities of patients and their families in our communities are front and center in terms of what we ought to be studying and what we ought to be learning about. That the, the systems in terms of how they're financed, their capacities, their, the, the system related issues have to be front and center as well. And then the priorities of, 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 of research communities uh, need to go in there. Is there an easy way, to, and, and it has to be layered, so there may be different priorities in some communities than in other communities. So it is a complex array to try to manage that. I don't think any systems across the world have figured this out um, in any, in any uh, great way. Uh, but uh, clearly there has to be a, a, a prioritization uh, process in place that actually uh, creates a learning agenda that we can, we can all agree to. Thanks so much, Rob. And Maureen, if you say three-legged stool, I have to ask Maureen if she has any insights into that. So Maureen, any comment? Yeah, thanks for that great question, Frank. If we start off with that assumption, we're not going to get anywhere. So I don't, I, I think that that would be the, the going down the wrong path for that hike and that we really have to start with finding out what is important and you know, we we've 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 got some experience doing that in in some of our patient partnered research now, and and in speaking to people that the priorities that are important to 
to researchers or clinicians or funders are not necessarily the ones that are important to uh, patients in the system. And so how do we know? Well, we know by talking to people and talking to a diverse group of people. And that's got to be done in a very systematic, well thought out way so that people are not left behind. And uh, so thanks for that great question. There's, there's a, a, a jump off question I have for Carrie. So, I mean, uh, relationship building comes up as a theme here over and over, whether it's within the organization, um, between government and organization, you know, across all levels. So, Carrie, can you speak to the importance of relationship building in this process? Thank you, Seema. Yeah, relationships are absolutely fundamental. And it's so important to take that time to really understand where everyone's coming from and what's important to each stakeholder. And this also links back to Frank's question about what if we have different priorities? What if we want to go in different directions? It's really important to look at, you know, do we align? Do we need to trade off on certain things and have a very open and frank discussion about what's on the table and what's off the table, but why? And if we look at windows of opportunity in the health system, perhaps there's an opportunity to move in a particular direction and align what we're working on to align with certain incentives in the system. Maybe it's something related to long-term care reform, for example. And having open discussions about what goes into the parking lot in terms of our priorities and ideas and what can we focus on. And as long as you take that time to get everyone on the same page, but in doing that also valuing the perspectives that people bring and openly responding to how you value what they bring to the table and explain why something can or maybe can't happen at a particular time will help people to understand what direction they're moving in. And we all have to trade off. We're all gonna be disappointed in this process, but if we do it in a respectful way and a way that really honors the different people that are coming to the table and going to their tables as well to get their perspectives, I think we can move ahead in a way that's a lot more respectful, but it's never going to be perfect. It's going to be a bit uncomfortable, um, but we just need to lean into that um, and move forward in that way. Thanks so much, Carrie. Um, we have another audience question from Stuart Nichols, which I'm going to pose to Rob first. So wonder what the role of funders are. So research is often uh, separately funded in regular cycles through applications to CHR, for example, and he'd appreciate the panel's thoughts on how we can disrupt the way we fund research and evaluation to fit this learning health systems approach. I have uh, the same question. So Rob. It's a, it's, a, it's a great question. And that is the second large tension that the world is, 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 is working around. If we're going to learn, merge a learning approach uh, the way that we've talked about it here, we actually also have to move to funding approach to this, uh, making sure that our funding that's occurring meet the priorities of patients uh, and, and systems at the different levels. Uh, and right now, um, the way your funding is oriented in, in Ontario, that's not a clear direction of actually how to do it. Um, and there is very, um, um, it, it's difficult to bridge funding uh, particularly among systems and and uh, and, uh, and and research funders, um, I also want to make the point, and, and I, so I don't have a solution other than we need some different ways to fund this work. The second is that just talking about the infrastructures to do this, to creating in embedded learning systems uh, in our system is investment that's needed to happen at the system level to bring in researchers to create environments for them to create uh, positions that are long lasting that we can learn over time. And right now there's very little way uh, in our current funding arrangements to, to, to fund the infrastructures that are needed to support this type of enterprise. So I'm gonna hand it maybe over to either John or Walter to, to supplement any points I've missed. Walter unmuted himself. So why don't you go ahead, Walter? Okay, great, thanks. Um, uh, you know, I think three things. Um, first off, um, it's a little bit about, you know, the funding and I'll come to that. Um, but frankly, it's also about the researchers and the system, the decision making, having the relationship and being part. So going back to Rob's slide that had the, you know, the separate silos coming down to actually being embedded and working together on the same problems with the same reasons. Um, and that's, that's embedded in relationships. So I think, um, the best way to think about how to get funding to align with your priorities is to already have that alignment within your research and the and the operational teams so that when the funding does become available you already have a team that is 
working with similar goals. Um, and you actually, I think you'll find that research and policy uh, can be brought into many of the existing competitions if you work that way. Uh, the second um, piece is around uh, leadership. Um, so uh, I will, you know, hats off to Vasanti uh, Srinivasan, who um, was at the Ministry of Health and required that policymakers, was able to lobby that policymakers required evidence to make decisions. Um, that change, that leadership inside the ministry changed the way the relationship works with uh, researchers out in the field um, because they needed to have that evidence in order to do it. Now, you know, uh, cabinet changes, but a lot of the institutional within the bureaucracy continue to think about the importance of evidence in their policy making. Uh, and so evidence-based policy making requires evidence and that that's foundational and that takes leadership within government. And then that leadership, I think, can collaborate. And I think, you know, the CIHR and other funding institutes are fairly open to collaboration when I look through some of the funding opportunities, particularly the strategic ones, maybe not the open operating ones, where I do see um, governments, ministries um, putting in co-funding for initiatives such as, you know, the current CIHR Think Implementation Science Grants. There's co-funding from a number of ministries in there. And, uh, and that's through those relationships and strategic funding opportunities. Thanks, Walter. I'm wondering, John, um, if you could weigh in here from an evidence support perspective. Sure. So uh, four quick reactions. One is, you know, for researchers, I think, you know, as Walter alluded to, funding for programs is so much more helpful than funding for individual projects because it allows you to build the relationships and so on over long periods of time. And I know there's a big focus on embedded researchers, which I wholeheartedly support. But I think that um, as we invest in embedded researchers, we need to figure out how do we help them answer the many, many questions that they're toolkit won't necessarily be able to provide and so they need to be good at conducting research they also need to be able to quickly find and use many forms of evidence to answer uh, other questions i think um, you can tell that the institute for better health at trillium is unique you see four people with the same background who bring different skill sets to learning health systems very few if any um, institutions in this province have that richness of a diverse team that can do this work, but that's where we need to get to at a province, as a province and kudos to uh, Trillium for making that kind of investment. Second thing is we need to formalize and strengthen our health evidence support system. We in invest separately in the innovation system. We invest separately in research. We have never formalized and strengthened our health evidence support system. I have spent the entire summer interviewing almost every deputy and ADM at the federal level we're now rolling this out to every province and territory. Uh, we're having conversations with all the pan-Canadian health organizations, and we need a much more joined up approach to how we respond in hours and days to urgent questions coming in from an array of decision makers and be able to pull multiple forms of evidence. The qualitative research, Nakia uh, emphasized the evaluative research that Walter brings many types of evidence. The third piece is funders have to uh, start to um, invest in the global evidence architecture. In COVID-19, the amount of waste from every single jurisdiction doing rapid syntheses, often of very low quality, was heartbreaking. The world would have been much better off with an evolving suite of high quality living evidence syntheses. And the future has to be one where on all of the big issues of the day, we have living evidence syntheses that those of us who have to respond in hours and days can quickly pull from, contextualize to the our local environment and put alongside Ontario and Canada specific evidence to give a more robust uh, answer. And the final piece, which maybe uh, would be a segue to Maureen, uh, we have to also invest in putting evidence at the center of everyday life for Ontarians and Canadians. We, we have virtually no investments in this space in Canada. So patients and citizens are out there trying to make sense of all of this stuff, but we 
can't turn to great sources. Um, Maureen and I have been on calls recently with Science Up First and, and a few other nascent initiatives in Canada, but Sense About Science has been at the leading edge of this work in the United Kingdom for 20 years, and Canada is so far behind. So Maureen, I don't know if you're willing to jump in, but uh, that Evidence Commission recommendation is there because of your role as one of our commissioners. Do you want to talk about putting evidence at the center of everyday life? Yeah, I think I've said it many times now, it's really creating a culture of evidence and a culture of evidence, you know, where the doors are thrust open to everyone fits into the learning health systems. Like I think it would be, it would, it would, it would enable the learning health systems to advance and to bring all of the people in when you talk about all of the perspectives that are needed. If we feel that we're part of the system and that we're in that culture of evidence and it's not an elite club where only you know scientists and clinicians um, are, are, are allowed in, I think that we can work together as Ontarians and build that learning health system. I see lots of nods from the panel, Maureen, uh, as you speak. Um, we have time, I think, for one last question. Um, and so, you know, I've been thinking this whole time about scale. Um, and how do you scale from like intervention to organization, organization to system? Um, that seems to be a challenge. And, and it looks like Maureen Marco Reed had a similar question, wondering how the scale up um, of an evidence based intervention with demonstrated effectiveness can be embedded into a learning health system. So, I'm wondering if maybe Nikia, you could take this one to start off. Maybe from your lens and then after that we can go to Carrie. Sure, good. that's a great question. Uh, sorry, my dog is continues to be jealous of, of me actually paying attention to things that are not him. Uh, so just coming from an equity lens and also considering the, the learning health system gears that uh, Rob showed everyone today, it's always about really having folks at the table, right? So kind of similar to what Carrie mentioned earlier and Maureen, making sure that folks that are actually actively using the mm -hmm. systems and folks that are actually delivering services are there to provide the information needed to move from, you know, your kind of organizational to system to system work. And I also think about the work that Tess and her team does too, right? So it's, it's you know, oftentimes there's a, an idea that gets sparked because of a lack of or an overflow of, particularly in, in the current context that we, we face in terms of challenges with staffing um, at the hospital level and beyond. And then how do you take those pieces of the puzzle and then work with various individuals, making sure that you're you're involving folks that often do not get the chance to, to speak up uh, and take that information and translate it into action. So I think it's it's a combination of, of pieces, but ultimately, once you identify something uh, and also considering the gears again, that you're working through and, and implementing and designing uh, interventions that have impact that are actively uh, actively uh, incorporate, actively taken up and, and informed by the people that are actually using it. Sorry, Carrie. Yeah, I think there's a lot of initiatives, interventions and best practices that are considered, you know, gold standard, but at the end of the day, they're getting implemented in very complex systems. And so what learning health system really stand, what really what really emphasizes is that we're always going to be tweaking and adapting, evaluating, even if something is the best practice for whatever reason, you know, it, it's complex. There's a lot of people with different types of behaviors and different intentions, different values that are trying to make sense of this thing that they're now trying to, to implement. So having that mindset of never being done, but being open to learning, evolving, adapting, and then tweaking and continue to evaluate that will help us continue to move because the context is changing, best practices will change, people change. And so I think having that, uh, what do we mean by you know, best practice? I think it has to be so best process and how we, how we do things. Wonderful. I think, okay, we have two minutes left. So what I like to do when I end a panel is give each speaker their last word. <laughs> so you get a sentence or two to leave the audience with when it comes to learning health systems in your unique lens. So I'll call upon people one by one, um, no pressure, but I'm going to start with John. Do you have uh, two sentences for the audience just for your last word of the day? Uh, thinking, think about building up your skills in evidence support, and I think those skills are complementary to skills in conducting research. I'm going to go next to Rob. Oh, 
I think you're muted, Rob. Get you to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. How about we go to Walter? Hi, thanks. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, one or two sentences. One, I think, <laughs> so, is that the support for learning health systems and using evaluation needs to be as close to the front lines as possible. Um, I'll just leave it there. It's not Karen? a distant, abstract, outside thing. It's right embedded. Wonderful. Carrie? So this is a quote by, by Stephen Covey, but also Frank Gavin, I have to credit him, patient leader in our system, who presented this quote um, in our class on patient-oriented research. And Stephen Covey said, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. So let's practice this at our next interaction, our next meeting, because fundamental to learning health systems is truly authentically listening to each other. Nikia. Okay, um, so a great quote by someone who I cannot recall of uh, the name once said, equality is ubiquitous, equity is not. And in order to truly have an innovative and effective learning health systems, we have to embed equity in all learning health system components. Uh, Rob, do you have your last sentence or words? Yeah, a couple of things. One is um, um, become closer to health systems and understand how they operate. Always think about systems, not institutions. We're, we're building integrated systems here. And then finally, always think about inc inclusive populations, uh, not just the people walking in the door. We have Tess. Um, so Walter had mine, so I will add. <laughs> um, I think. <laughs> Uh, learning health system, being becoming a learning health system is not separate work. It's our work as providers. And I think it's just reinforcing that uh, research patient, but that provider and health team is a key partner. And, and that this is not work that can be done by someone else. This is the work that we all need to collectively do and we will all collectively benefit from. And then Maureen, you have the first word and you'll get the last word. <laughs> it's pretty hard to follow all that up, but I would say embrace disruption and embrace all the problems and all of the challenges that come with disruption. We did that 11 years ago with, with uh, patient-oriented research. People said it would be a trend, it would go away. It didn't go away. And I, I guess I would say that, um, that that stool might wobble a bit more before it finally stabilizes because disruption is tough. But I think that we're that we can get there and uh, just um, take take the good with the bad and and start all over again if it doesn't work. But quickly, don't wait five years to do it. Just quickly. Thank you. Thanks. And with that, Maureen, we're at time. So I just want to very quickly thank the panelists for such a wonderful discussion. And I want to thank specifically Visanthi um, and the entire OSU team as well as the tech team for um, just bringing us all together to be part of this integral discussion of this new approach and approach to Ontario healthcare. So I'll throw it back to you, Dean, as the master of ceremonies. Thanks so much. Oh, wonderful, Sina. And uh, thank you to for moderating and, and the panel for a truly fantastic session. Uh, you know, not just uh, teaching us about the learning health system and its promise, but, but the challenges that we must face and, and tackle to achieve that promise. Just truly fantastic session and it's wonderful to see how patient-oriented approaches are having such a meaningful impact on the development of the learning health systems. <laughs>